Hi, I'm Darren and welcome to Level Up Double E Lab. In today's episode, I'm getting back to the George Collins collection that I showed in my 1000 subscriber episode. And from that collection, I've selected this Heathkit IG-102 RF signal generator for restoration. And as you can see, it turned out great. This is what the IG-102 looked like when I got it. Right away my first concern was with the condition of the front panel. It was very dirty and it had a lot of blotches on it that might have been permanent rust spots. On the upside all of the controls rotated easily with the exception of the range adjustment. It would not budge and I was not going to honk down on it just to force it. Inside it was clean, there were no missing or burnt components and it looked like it still had all the original resistors and capacitors. Now I mentioned in the 1000 subscriber episode that it has a lot of caps. Fortunately most of them are mica and ceramic and those do tend to hold up well over the years. Also in that episode I tried to power it on using my dim bulb tester and I saw right away that the power supply was not working correctly. More than likely it's just bad filter caps but first I needed to verify that the power transformer is still good. To do that, I cut the lead on diode D1 to isolate the power transformer from the rest of the circuit. Then I can slowly apply AC line voltage. This item contains hazardous voltage and safety precautions must be followed. If you're following along and working on your own version, you're doing so at your own risk. And right away the power indicator lit up. That's a good sign that the filament windings in the transformer are working okay. To confirm that and also to check the high voltage windings, I used my good old Heathkit IM13 vacuum tube voltmeter. I don't need high accuracy with this test, I just need to see that the AC voltages are in the ballpark. The filament voltage checks out at just over 6 volts, so that's fine. Switching to the 500 volt range, I can check out the high voltage windings, and those measure out at just under 150 volts. So good news, the transformer checks out fine. Moving right along, I tested the two vacuum tubes. And hey, what the heck was that? Let's see that again. I've never seen a tube flash like that. Is it bad? Well, apparently not. This specific tube is a Muller 12AT7, also labeled as an ECC81, and apparently from what I found online, these have a construction where a bit of filament flash on power on is normal. The rest of the tests check out just fine. There's no shorts, the emission looks strong, and no grid leakage. And the other tube, a 6AN8, also checks out fine, no issues. So with no obvious problems with the two tubes, I moved ahead with tackling caps and resistors. There's only 15 resistors in this design, and they all checked out fine to within 10% or so. And on the cap side, we have a double electrolytic in the power supply and three films in the rest of the circuit. Those all need to be replaced along with the diode I cut earlier to do the transformer test. But before I replace those components, I want to tackle the dirty front panel. And to make it easier to get it completely clean, I'm going to remove it from the case. That means, of course, each knob and control retaining nut has to come off. Removing the knobs gives me an opportunity to clean them too. I also removed the two quirky input jacks. Those are really obsolete nowadays. I'll replace them with BNCs later. Here's the panel removed. It only took about 20 minutes to get it off the case. You can really see how blotchy that dirt accumulation is. And here it is after cleaning with regular car wash detergent. And I got lucky. It cleaned up real nice. Now, unlike the Heathkit HW101 that I recently restored, this paint is still very much intact. There's only a few surface scratches. And after it dried, I put a coat of carnauba wax on it to help protect it. I also took the unusual step to desolder and remove the band switch from the chassis. It's locked up and getting it unstuck will be a lot easier with it in a vise. Plus, this gives me much better access for cleaning the contacts. I start with a pencil eraser on the easy to reach areas. Next, I use these small foam brushes to apply contact cleaner a drop at a time to just the contacts. This helps keep excessive cleaner off of the insulators. And these foam brushes work much better than cotton swabs. But before I started cleaning the contacts, I had sprayed the joint between the bushing and the shaft with WD-40. I think this one was seized because the grease in these joints tend to dry out over time. 
Sometimes it's worse. Sometimes the aluminum on aluminum interface galls together. But I caught a break here. The WD-40 dissolved the dried grease and broke it free. Then I sprayed in some of that gel lube to give it some fresh lubrication. And now it rotates just fine. I mentioned earlier that I was going to replace the two input jacks. <laughs> These are funky, old, obsolete microphone connectors. Good luck finding any modern cables to fit to them. So bye bye and hello BNC. I should also note that this is a very common change made to old Heathkit equipment. Let's hope BNC will be around for a few more decades. It helps that they're a drop-in fit. No mods are needed to the panel or to the chassis. And here's what the rest of the panel looks like after reinstallation. Quite the transformation. I think it looks great. Even the knobs have their shine back. After the cosmetics were done, I tackled the electrical repairs. Here's the new DC power supply filter caps and replacement diode installed. These here are new AC line filter safety caps. I swapped those in after pulling the stock ceramic ones out. And lastly, there are three film caps in the modulation circuit. Two of them are behind the panel here, and here's the third one up front. Okay, time to power it on and see what happens. <laughs> Naturally, I'm using my dim bulb tester for this. It's off screen. You guys have seen enough of it already. And looky here, it's coming to life. Victory is mine. A quick check shows that the controls are functioning like they should. If you were really paying close attention to my repairs, you would have seen a small little black magic marker mark that I put on these film caps. And what I'm doing here is I'm following a best practice that Paul talks about over on Mr. Carlson's lab. Now on his channel, he gets much more in depth into restoring vintage tube gear. And one of the things he recommends on these newer film caps is to identify which end, uh, which wire lead end is the outside foil. So you always connect that to either the ground in the circuit or the lower impedance side, I think it is. But the principle for doing that is pretty simple. He even published a little circuit and I built up my version of it that I connect up with a little you know, nine volt battery inside this case and connect it up to even one of my old analog Tektronix scopes. And within a few seconds, I can tell where the outside foil is and I mark it. And I do that on these caps soon after I buy them and certainly before I put them in, put them in any gear. Not sure if that's important for an R signal generator, but I already had the caps marked, so they were good to go. Next up is calibration. First step is a rough adjustment by turning capacitor C6. Then each of the bands, with the exception of the highest band, has an individual slug adjustable inductor on the band switch. Now in the manual, Heathkit gives a pretty crude method to follow if they ever need retuning. Clearly this procedure was written back in the day when hardly anyone had access to a frequency counter. The one in my Siglent, however, is plenty accurate enough to use here, so it only took a bit of tweaking to get them all dialed in to within the factory 2% spec. So all in all, this was a pretty easy restoration, certainly within the ability of someone looking to tackle their first piece of vintage tube gear. It also helped that George clearly took good care of it years ago, and most of the items that I had to deal with were just normal degradation from time and from storage. The only other thing I could possibly justify doing to it is replacing the stock two-wire AC power cord with a modern three-prong cord. That's a pretty simple mod, and I might just do that in the future. All right, let's take a quick look at the performance of this IG-102. And to do that, I've got it connected up to my new 2202 so we can take a, a look at the, the sine wave output that's coming out of the generator. Now, I do have the scope set at 1 meg input impedance. I can change that to 50 to match the output impedance that the generator is rated to. But I did notice that there's more distortion to the signal, especially at the lower end, um, when it's trying to drive 50 ohms instead of having uh, 1 meg input impedance. Uh, now... I did some reading online. I found some discussion about modifying the attenuator in this guy to up the output impedance to several hundred ohms, which apparently reduces the loading on that 6AN8 output tube. I did not do that. I figured I'd save that for some future owner beyond me who may have an interest in modifying it. So I just left it stock as it is. And as we'll see as we go through some of these other frequency bands, there is some lower uh, distortion that shows up. Uh, as I increase the frequency. So it might just be a nature of the circuit that's in there. But again, this is not the kind of signal generator where you're looking for a pure sine wave output. And another factor about it is the amplitude is not constant. As I increase the frequency, you'll see it go up and down uh, across various bands. But it is working 
and certainly working within what you'd expect from a, a unit of this era. So let me change ranges now. So I'll go up to the range B. You can see the amplitude change and of course it's starting to go up as I increase it in frequency. Let me change the scope here so we can still see a few um, cycles on screen. I'll go to uh, range C and just for kicks I'll put that at about, let's see, C is on this scale. Let's put that at 2 megahertz and scope is saying 2.01 so not bad at all. Let me keep adjusting the scope time base here and probably knock this down a bit too. We'll go up to um, range D. Okay, and you can see it's working and see how much that amplitude changes as I'm on the range from 3.1 to 11 megahertz. Range E is 10 to 32 megahertz. Again, that amplitude is cha Ooh, changing quite a bit on this scale. And the last one is 32 meg to 110 meg. And for that, I'm going to have to really adjust the scope settings here. There we go. Not bad. Let me put this on 50. And the scope says 50.6. So not too bad, but not going to use this as a calibrated frequency standard by any means. So it definitely seems to be working the way you'd expect it to work. There's one more mode I'd like to demonstrate with this uh, IG-102, and that is amplitude modulation on the RF signal. Now, like a lot of RF signal generators of this era, it does have a built-in uh, modulator, like 400 hertz, I think it is. And as you can see, freeze the scope there, it's acceptable. It certainly looks like it's over-modulating a bit there, but it'll get the job done. And what we're hearing, of course, is I needed to have an AM receiver to pick it up. And the easiest thing to do is got my old Holocrafters S38E, which is a future restoration and repair project I'll do someday here. It's got a lot of 60 hertz hum in it, but works well enough for, for this demo. I've got the Heath kit set to around 700 kilohertz, got it dialed in here. That's how we're able to hear it. And in addition to the internal signal generator. You can actually feed a, a signal into it uh, from another audio range generator, in this case my Simpson. So I have it hooked up to the input and we can modulate the signal that way too. Woohoo! <laughs> so pretty basic but certainly usable for troubleshooting circuits to figure out if they're working or not. One criticism of this IG-102 that I read online is that it's leaky, meaning that it tends to radiate RF energy outside of the case. And I can see where that might be a concern because again, it doesn't have a three-prong cord on it. And maybe that will help because it'll ground the entire case and provide more shielding. It also doesn't have you know multiple layers of shielding on the inside of it like a modern signal generator. So I'll be looking for that when I use it. And I do intend to use this when I'm troubleshooting tube gear in the future. So as always, I thank you for watching my channel and for watching this episode on this simple signal generator. I do hope you enjoyed the material. And until next time, bye for now.